Good morning. Good morning. Would you stand with me? We sing, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died and rose again. I believe he paid for us all. Find someone you haven't met yet this morning and greet them in the name of the Lord. We are glad you're here this morning, and uh, you are certainly welcome to continue the conversations after church, if you like. Uh, there'll be opportunity to do that. We'll leave the lights on for you, and you can just spend the afternoon here fellowshipping. 
On the end of each row, there's a little slip of paper called the People of Elkton Missionary Church. If you would take a moment and fill those out, we'd appreciate that. Uh, a couple of things, if you're a visitor here this morning and you'd like some information on the church, we'd ha be happy to send that to you if you put your address on there. And we always uh, encourage you to put a prayer request on there if you have any. We'd love to pray with you uh, for that. This week, um, actually starting uh, last Thursday night, was our missionary church camp at in Brown City. And uh, that runs all week. So there's, uh, there's actually... A, uh, a musical concert at 2.30 this afternoon down at Brown City. And then there's evening services every night this whole week at 7 p.m. Uh, at Brown City Camp. The nice thing is they also live stream it. Um, so Sue and I were able to watch that uh, last night because we were on the road yesterday taking Angie and Norris to um, Detroit Metro Airport with nine bags of luggage and four carry-ons and two kids. Yeah, they had to take the kids. We could have, you know. Um, but praise the Lord, uh, we got a text from Angie this morning that they made it to, to Egypt, uh, to Cairo. And uh, just appreciate your prayers for, for them in the days ahead. Um, I think he starts uh, work tomorrow uh, as a principal there. So um, take your bulletin out, if you, uh, <clears throat> if you would. Um, there's a couple inserts in there that we... Oh, yeah, wave it at me. Sorry, some of you are so conditioned <laughs> to do that. I appreciate that. Uh, um, there's a, a few inserts in there. Um, one is uh, concerning uh, a Cross Lutheran Church and uh, school. As we, uh, I was telling David Fopo this morning, I think Missionary Church has taken over the school. Uh, a number of our folks are involved in, in teaching there, and uh, Dave is the interim principal of the school, and uh, so just opportunities to, to really make that a, a um, as a Christian school in our community, so you have that insert, and then also the uh, the Operation uh, Christmas Child, the shoe boxes. Um, next week, we're going to show some videos. We're going to share a little bit about uh, about that, but it shows you on the back um, of, the, of the insert a few ideas about packing your shoe box, and uh, so we're going to start working on that, and again, as uh, the sales are, are uh, in full steam for uh, back to school, that you can get some supplies for that and uh, more about that later on. See, uh, next uh, Sunday, the, uh, the 12th, we'll be uh, starting some, uh, some new series uh, in our preaching. But also, uh, this will be our, our last picnic at the Parsonage. So on uh, August the 12th at 5.30, we'd love to have you come out be a part of that. Uh, last month, we were able to pull out the water slide, and uh, I think the, the water wars, I'm pretty sure I won, because um, I ended up with, you think, Jim? I think, pretty sure that I, I won, uh, because I had the hose at the end, um, and so you have to take advantage of that when you can, but we'd love to see you out there. Just time of fellowship, and uh, you might actually be continuing the conversation that you had this morning. Let's see, I think the other things you can see in there, uh, as far as the, the fall startup, this is August, which means that school starts real soon, and uh, ministry uh, start off, kick off on September the 9th with a number of activities, our acorn bank breaking, and if you don't know what that is, out on the, the foyer there's a, um, a place where there's plastic acorn banks, and uh, yes, we get to smash those uh, on the uh, September 9th. The week before that will be our community service. It's just a great time for the Church of Elkton to come together and to, to worship together. So the uh, United Methodist Church and the Wesleyan Church and us, we, we gather together uh, outside of this building at 9.30 on that Sunday morning and worship the Lord as the Church of Elkton. And uh, uh, put that on your calendar. It's always a great time uh, for that. The other thing that we'll be starting up this fall, we call them life groups. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, ways to gather together in small groups, uh, not just to get together and have coffee and cake, uh, although that might be a part of it, uh, but to, to discover ways that we can impact our community uh, by making disciples. And how do we do that, and how is that fleshed out in these groups? Um, so we're just working at that and putting those together, and some more information will be coming on those. I think, again, those are all the things... Uh, 
that I wanted to, to share with you this morning. Uh, if the ushers could come at this time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this day, for the day that we can come together and worship you, the day that we can be uh, in this place. Thank you, Lord, that we have the freedom to worship. Thank you that we can, um, that we can come as the family of God. Thank you, Lord, that we can, uh, we can give to you. Lord, that you, uh, one of your characteristics is you are a giver. And so, Lord, we can be more like you as we give. And I pray that you would take these tithes and offerings today, Lord, and you would use them to further your kingdom. You would use them to make an impact in our, in our community. Lord, there are lost people here, uh, right next door, right in our uh, place of work, where we go to school, where we interact. Lord, I pray that you would um, just give us opportunities to share that life-changing message of Jesus Christ with those around us. And we thank you, Lord, as we give, that that message can go out from here and around the world. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. As the worship team comes, I, one other thing I forgot to mention, there are still some prayer journals for August uh, on that back table back there. Uh, it's not too late uh, to get those, pick those up, and uh, to use those as uh, prayer prompters uh, uh, every day uh, through the month of August. So we'd love to have you take those uh, with you. Let's continue to worship.
partner kind of let go and you almost fell. Isn't it awesome to know that when we lean on God, he'll never trick us like that and make us almost feel like we're going to fall? Amen. Amen. It's a good thing to know. <laughs> My heart is overwhelmed, I will look to you alone, God my rock, God my rock, God my rock, you will stand when others fall, you are faithful through it.
Lord, thank you for the blood that was shed for us. That the demonstration of God's love that even while we were yet sinners, Jesus, you died for us. And washes away our sin. Sin has no more control. That gives us hope for life today and hope for eternity. What love you have for us. Thank you, Jesus, for that reminder, that affirmation, and for the hope we have in you. Amen. You may be seated. I believe the preschoolers can be dismissed. <coughs> the preschoolers dismissed for junior church. As I mentioned last week, we have a special guest. We have a couple special guests. Well, there's a number of special guests here, but um, only two of them that are going to come and talk, I guess. Uh, Robert and Rosa, come on up. Robert Harmon uh, is no stranger to many of you. He's strange, but he's no stranger to many of you. <laughs> no stranger than you. No stranger than I am, but, so that's good. But uh, um, they're going to be sharing uh, what God is doing through the... Uh, Accelerated Bible Translation, Wycliffe, and uh, we're just going to let you go. Would you like to speak? You can't hear that one, yeah. Okay, here we go. Go ahead. First, I want to uh, thank you all for your partnership, because without you, we wouldn't be able to um, go to all the different places that we go to to help people translate the Bible into the mother tongue. Yes, it, it's always good to come back home. Uh, as we lived here for a while, and as Reggie said, we know many of you. Do you have some pictures there, David? There we go. Vision 2025. Back in the late 90s, there were several Bible translation organizations that got together and looked at the rate at which new languages were being started to, tra to translate the Bible into their languages. And as they looked at the rate that things were happening, they determined that at the rate it was going, it would be 2150 before they started translating the last language. And prayerfully, they considered it and said, that's not soon enough. And they set the goal of 2025, taking 125 years, which would mean seriously accelerating the rate of translation. A lot of people said that's not possible. And yet, committed to move forward toward that goal. It was actually while I was here four years ago in, in uh, 2014 that my boss was testing a new methodology. And we spent quite a bit of time on the phone uh, while I was here, we were down at Brown City Camp, talking about how do we go forward? Was Wycliffe Associates going to get behind this? What was gonna happen? They finally committed amount of money to put some money in the budget for the next year and the expectation was set that with the amount of money they put in the budget that we would work with at least 25 languages helping them get started with translation in the next year because of the way God works we worked with over 200 languages in that first year and since then have worked with over 1200 languages helping them get started with Bible translation over 250 of those have already completed their New Testament, and many are working on their Old Testament in the last four years. Next slide. MAST, Mobilized Assistance Supporting Translation. This is the methodology. It's a simple process, eight easy steps of helping nationals to translate the Bibles themselves. In the past, we would recruit somebody like you, come go to another country, learn the language, and translate the Bible into their language. The philosophy was one family, one language, one lifetime. And many times a family would spend 30, 40, 50 years 
translating the Bible into another language. With progression, one of the things that we looked at, when Bible translation started, the first translations from the Greek and the Hebrew were done by people that spoke the language and wanted to have the Bible in their language. We've cy cycled back to that now. Rather than outsiders come and learning the language, it's back to working with nationals and helping them to do it. Church ownership is the other key issue. As opposed to other support organizations, other parachurch organizations being the ones responsible for Bible translation, the goal is getting the local church people in the countries where the languages are, as well as support from the home country, but in the languages where they are, of taking responsibility for Bible translation. I talk about five E's. The first is that we need to engage the local church. They need to know about the opportunity. Many places around the world still haven't heard that they can actually translate the Bible into their own language with appropriate training. Usually, it doesn't take a, a lot of encouraging once we've taught them, we've presented them with the opportunity. But the goal is not just for us to be in charge, but for them to be in charge and it be their project, not our project. The second E is to enable them with methodology. Teach them how to do it. But once again, along with teaching them how, part of it is inspiring them to do it. Just because you know how to do something doesn't always mean that you're committed to getting it done. And that's part of the thing. And, and much of that, once again, comes from the work of the Holy Spirit working to touch their hearts to make decisions about what they're going to do. The third E is to equip them, providing technology, computers, uh, internet connectivity sometimes, in order to accelerate the process. And once again, having to teach them how to use it once they've got it. Uh, at the workshop that Rosa was at recently, many of the people, we do an assessment at the beginning to see how their skills are in a number of different areas. One of them is computers. And several of the people said, oh, so that's a computer. I've heard about those things, but I've never really seen one before. And so that's what we have to deal with sometimes of moving them forward. Then we talk about empowering. You hear that word a lot. But we realize and try to encourage them that we're not the ones that empower them. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers them. And that it's important that they realize that, that their power comes from the work of the Holy Spirit in them. And then the fifth E is to encourage them as we follow up and, and see how things are going. Uh, this is a map of the Pacific area. Uh, on, the, on the left is Indonesia, which has between 800 and 1,000 languages, and Papua New Guinea on the right, which also has about that many, and then a variety of other islands there. In the last year, we've been privileged to work with over 100 different languages in the Pacific to help them learn the methodology and begin translating the Bible into their language. I believe it's 11 now that have actually finished their New Testament in the last year. So God is doing some cool things. Rosa, tell us about this picture. Okay, this was a very important uh, trip. Okay, We were going to meet with the United Church Synod. Synod. <laughs> and um, like I said, it was very important because this meant that the church was going to be um, the one in charge. They were going to take over instead of us coming there to, this is the way, you, you know, it's done. So um, that trip was a two-hour trip from the main island to a very small island. And uh, the girl on my right, her name is Yara, and uh, Yara and I became very, very, very tight friends. And when I mean tight, very tight, because that boat would not stop going up and down, up and down, <laughs> up and down. And uh, she didn't know how to swim. I did not know how to swim. And we like bonded immediately <laughs> and started praying, and Jesus was our main, main focus the whole two hours. I mean, we literally hung on to each other the whole two hours. And Robert, even though he's such a great swimmer and he scuba dive and all these things, he says that this was the worst boat ride he ever had, okay? But not only that, once we arrived at the island, you know, 
uh, we encounter many other uh, good adventures, okay? And one of them that would never go away from my mind was meeting this old gentleman who was eating snack with Jar and I, and he uh, started telling me his testimony, how he became a Christian. And he said to me, you know, Rosa, I used to be one of those Papua New Guineans that ate people. Oh my gosh, you know, I was like in shock. I could not speak any, any longer. I was looking at him and looking at him. But I started to think, I'm like, how awesome is our God that all the way over there, this person that had never heard of God had given all those awful belief and awesome, and, and not awesome, but I mean, all, um, all these, to me, weird um, ways of life. You know, he had been such a good person to accept Jesus and, 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 and have him in his heart and now working so hard to help the other people around the villages there. So um, it was amazing to see, you know, how God works. But not only that, you know, a little fear stayed in me because that night um, we were staying at this um, hut. Hot, yeah, and next to our hut, there was uh, where the ladies were cooking. But these ladies were cooking all night long, okay, and they were just singing and cooking, singing and cooking. In my mind, I thought, oh, what if there are some of these people that are not really saved? If they decide to hop up here and take us down <laughs> and kill us and cook us. You know, well, you know, I woke Robert up, and <laughs> you know, we were just like, eh, "Don't, don't worry, don't worry." You know, we'll pray. You know, God is here with us. Oh, no, no problem. You know, so that was that uh, trip that was unforgettable, unforgettable. But it was very, very important. Yes, uh, the people on both ends of this picture. The guy in the white shirt with the red stripes was the bishop. He was the one in charge, and the guy on the other end. Uh, Reverend Ignatius were the two people we had worked with had invited us to this synod meeting so that we could present about about mass and about Bible translation They voted to do three things that were very significant First of all they voted as a church to partner with Wycliffe Associates in Bible translation for the 60 some languages in their region that needed to have the Bible and That they would partner with us to do that secondly they voted to establish a translation and literacy desk or department within the United Church, and they voted $10,000 to fund it. You know, it's one thing to say, yeah, we want to do it, but, you know, they say, put your money where your mouth is, <laughs> and they actually voted money to help make it happen. So this was a very exciting outcome of the rough ride, all the stuff, the fear. It was exciting to see God working. Now, we scheduled then... A workshop for March and one of the things that's happened is as we've been working and helping people with translating the Bible the amount of spiritual warfare has escalated significantly from what's happened in the past Satan doesn't want people getting the Bible in their language and he does all sorts of things to fight against it from a rough boat ride to fear and all these sort of things as things worked out with the United Church, we were supposed to have six language groups show up. About three weeks before the event, they contacted me and said, well, we've had some problems we're going to need to postpone. We already had a group of volunteers. I don't know how well you can see. The few white skins in the picture there were all people that had already bought their tickets. They'd already paid money, and there was not refundable tickets. What do we do now? The leader of the, that group had actually been to Papua New Guinea before, so he said, well, let's go and we'll see what God works out. Well, as it worked out, the young lady, Yara, that had been in the boat with Rosa, had been working with some groups. Uh, three of the groups had done some work with Open Bible Stories a couple years earlier. They were interested in moving forward. In a matter of three weeks' time, we were able to get five language groups with eight or ten people from each language to show up for this workshop. And so it, it, 
the thing that's always exciting is to see in the midst of struggles and challenges how God comes through and works miraculously to get things done if we're willing to trust him and continue to move forward. If he can get us discouraged or upset, then that messes things up. But as long as we trust him and move forward, he does great things. Then a month after that, I was off to Togo in East and West Africa. And once again, it was a church group. Actually, there were people from several different churches that came together. And this was more of an informational meeting. We had a three-day session. The first day, we talked about vision and about the need for people in Togo and in some of the surrounding countries to get the Bible in their language. And we had them practice a little bit and see how practical it was. And it was great to see their enthusiasm. The next day, we started talking about goals. What can you do as church leaders here in Togo to get the job done? And they started setting some goals. And by the third day, they actually set down a plan to move forward. We're scheduled to go back to the end of next month to move forward with that plan toward getting the Bible into the pe people groups in Togo. And it's exciting to see how God works. One of the things that impressed me with them was their fervency in prayer. As we had times of prayer together, feeling their heart and seeing their excitement that God was going to work in their country or work through them, not outsiders, but through them to get the job done. So then we were back to Papua New Guinea, and you see some red lines. I think you can see them on the screen. Yes, there are four islands that are underlined up there. Uh, we had the six groups from United Church now that did finally come together. The one the farthest to the right is an island called Booty Booty. A uh, very small island, only about 500 people speak the language, but they wanted the Bible in their language. You talked about the boat ride we had. They had basically the same sort of boat ride, only it's normally an eight-hour ride across the open ocean in about a 20-foot boat to get to Alatau, and that was what they had to do. However, the winds were really strong blowing toward them, and the waves were really high, and they got part of the way there and actually ran out of gas. They were lost at sea for 12 hours, overnight, before somebody finally located them and got them there. This is some of the spiritual warfare that's happening. God is trying, Satan is trying to prevent them from getting God's word. But they made it and, and did a great job. Uh, there's the six groups working together, uh, one at each table. I could spend a great deal of time talking about some of the way God brought things together. The table that's closest to the front here of this picture, uh, a group of young men, the pastor from this particular language group, uh, didn't get anybody from their island to come. He actually recruited some young men in their early 20s from Alatau, where we're having the meeting, that spoke this language. They showed up at the last minute, not very active in the church, but God did some really cool stuff in their hearts throughout the week. We have in several of the workshops, in some of the workshops in Indonesia, where we've had Muslims actually come up to help with translation, and in doing the translation, see God speak to their hearts and have them accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. At one of them, we actually did a baptism at the end of the, at the end of the workshop, and several of them were baptized because they had met Jesus while they're doing the translation. And that's one of the cool things about this. It's not just about translation. It's about transformed lives. That's what it's all about. They fed us well. Yes, um, they fed us very well. They fed us uh, a lot of fiber. On the right side, you could see this beautiful um, plate. And uh, guess what this is made of? It's made from a palm tree. It's called sago palm. And what they do is that they take the inside of the palm and they mash it up very well. What else do they do? Oh, they cook it one way or another. They, they, I don't know, but they cook it. And uh, then they added uh, scrambled eggs and tomatoes and um, chives. chives, you know. The ladies that were doing the cooking, you know, wow. Those ladies were there from 7 o'clock, I think, till like 9 o'clock because they did uh, breakfast for the translators, 
snack or lunch or another snack, uh, dinner. I mean, they were working around the clock. Wow, it's awesome to see, you know, the yes. devotion. It, it's interesting actually eating wood. So, uh, <laughs> not real nourishing, but it does give you lots of fiber. So, uh, um, and then Rosa, tell them about your group. No, but I, I want to say that you know this lady that made that special dish. You know she, you know she took a long time to do it. So you know she, it was a very special occasion for us, okay? Because it was uh, another of the um, Wendy, um, oh. another of the people that came with us, and it was her birthday, so she made that for her, you know, yes. and us, you know. So this well, is before, my before you talk about yeah. your group. When we got there, one of the first people that we saw, oh yes, Rosa turned to me and said, "You know, guess who I saw? The first person that I saw was that person, that tall, the older man that I had seen in the other island before, the one that told me they had eating people." I thought, Robert, <laughs> first Robert, one she encounters is the guy who that eats is people. There, you know. <laughs> yeah. So um, this was my group. My group was one of the smallest group. We only had five people. And my group was, um, I don't think they uh, had very high education. I think the highest education was like sixth grade, I think, you know. But the enthusiasm that they had was Amazing, you know. One of the uh, uh, the people that is not there was the oldest one in the group, and he was sick at the time. But poor thing, you know, he couldn't see. He, you know, we gave him a pair of uh, Robert's uh, glasses so, so that he could, you know, do his work. And um, none of them had seen a computer before. Okay. But uh, you should have seen them typing with one finger at a time, you know, especially the lady to the right and the gentleman on the left. You know, they were eager to learn, eager to learn. But I, I said, oh my gosh, you know, this way, we're <laughs> never going to be done. We're never going to be done. And, you know, we're going to be maybe halfway done. So um, I had to kind of... Uh, speed the process. I, I'm not a good typist, but, you know, I put it all in, in God's hand, and you wouldn't believe it, we were the first group that had the Bible in their, in their mother tongue, so it was awesome to see the, the enthusiasm. Yes, it was cool to see her group be the first one through all the editing and everything. Uh, this is all six. The, what it says at the top of each one of those is in the mother tongue. That's the word Mark. That is the book of Mark, and then the language is at the bottom. And we, we finished up a little after midnight on the last night that we got everything printed for them to take home a copy. And then they did a celebration the next day. We actually left uh, before the celebration because we had a flight to catch. But it's exciting to see their enthusiasm as they get the Bible in their language. And part of the thing that happens is the response consistently, I think every time we've done it, I've had the same response, is now God speaks our language, now he's our God, he's not a foreign God anymore. Before they've had to read about God in a different language or have somebody translate it for them into their language, and it's been a foreign God. But now God speaks our language, and what a tremendous difference that makes. The other thing we always do is to work on Developing, helping them develop what we call a quality checking measurement or a rubric for those of you that are in education. A standardized measure of how to determine is, what's the quality of what you've translated. Uh, some of you may remember uh, Mark Weidman and Kathy and I going to Myanmar and did the first quality checking workshop in Myanmar. And this is part of what we taught is how to determine in a very systematic way if you have a good translation. Basically, a list of qualities of a good translation, and then questions to say, does it meet this quality? And if they can answer yes to all of those questions, then yes, it's a good translation. 
Part of the thing we tell them, if, if any of them is a no, then you need to fix it. Because this is God's word, and this isn't just a scoring mechanism. It's a way to make sure that if it, it isn't good yet, we fix it and make it right. And it's exciting to see their enthusiasm, to, once again, to help them be independent in this process of not only translating God's word, but making sure they have it in an in exciting fashion. The other thing that came out of this workshop, which was very encouraging, was this was the first MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with a church denomination. WA had worked with a lot of other parachurch organizations in the past, but this goal is to get the church to take responsibility. And there's two parts. If you have the local church down at the grassroots level, they're the ones that are doing the translation, and often they don't have much money. But if you can get the church denomination to be enthused also, they can help provide facilities, they can help provide supervision and leadership, and working together, they can do a great job in getting the job done. And so this was the first, the first one that we've had of an agreement with the local the denomination to take responsibility for Bible translation in the Milne Bay area of Papua New Guinea. And I really felt blessed to be able to be a part of that. Then two weeks ago today, I was standing with one foot on the north side and the other on the south side of the equator in Uganda, out in East Africa. Um, I'd never been to the, well, I've probably been across the equator before, but never seen anything like that. So that, that was kind of cool as, as God took us out there. Uh, Rosa didn't get to go with me on that one. There's a church there called the Rukangiri Community Church. The guy in the denim in the middle, the little short guy, Pastor Elisha, has been at this church for not quite 15 years. He has 40 church plants that have been developed in 15 years. He's developed a, a staff, and once again, our goal was not only to help do some translation, but to help inspire them with the whole thing of church ownership. And, and it was just tremendously exciting once again to see what God did as several of his leaders came together and we were training them. They actually have a workshop that starts tomorrow that they're doing by themselves now that we've trained them. And then there's another one the end of September uh, that we're supposed to go back and just, and they're going to do an oral translation with one of the, it's a group of what they call forest people, people that live in the woods, uh, have never gotten used to living in houses, but when, we came and, when they came and talked to them about the opportunity to get the Bible, they were very excited about it. And they're looking to get 30 or 40 people together, actually, to learn how to translate. And we have material for them, equipment, once again, the technology to be able to record it. And they can put it on a cell phone or an MP3 player or something so they can have God's word in an oral me method to be able to listen and hear what God has to say to them. Uh, we talked about the spiritual warfare. The ride from the airport to this little town is normally six or seven hours. Uh, it took us 12, uh, just because of hassles. Uh, <clears throat> we got partway there, and the front end started shaking, and we pulled over and stopped and discovered there was one lug nut holding the right front tire on. <laughs> and if you look at that picture closely, you can see that there are only two studs sticking out. There were three studs missing. Uh, we managed to find a nut and get the tire bolted on, so we had two, two bolts holding it and got to the next town. This was Sunday afternoon, and we found this mechanic who brought his toolbox, that white bag, with all his tools in it. And he came, and he actually had two lug nuts, so we now had four instead of two, and managed to get about another 30 or 40 kilometers to the town where the driver lived. Uh, and he stayed over and got the car fixed properly. Somebody from the church came and picked us up. So we finally got there about 10:30, 11 o'clock at night on Sunday night when we were supposed to be there at noon. Um, so things got delayed, but that often happens. Like I say, Satan is working hard to keep this from happening. Uh, when we did get there, we didn't have any luggage. It's the first time I've ever not had any luggage get there. We had four suitcases, all the training materials I had, uh, of course, clothes, all that fun stuff. And it was the middle of the week before we got any of that. So it's, it's just exciting to see God work. Uh, here's the group of people, the six people that from the one language group. There were supposed to be ten, only six showed up. And you see them have a, a, a copy of this in their hand. Because there were only six, and we actually only had four days, 
they translated first and second Peter and they were able to take them each one took home two copies for them to read and to share with a friend the other thing in the other hand is a certificate of completion we did that partially because in talking about the goal once again their goal was not just to go home and continue translating but we had challenged them for each one to find four or five people that would work with them so that instead of having six people translating the New Testament, they'd now have 30 or 40. And their goal is to finish the New Testament in the next three months. And to finish the whole Bible in the next year. And to see that enthusiasm and excitement is part of what keeps me going. The older gentleman in the middle there, oh, not quite, the older gentleman in the middle there, off well, just to the right, is Nathan. Nathan is 81 years old. And one of the things we had each person do in the final day when we do our celebration, we had each one of them read in their mother tongue two or three of the verses that God had spoken to them with as they were doing the translation. And after they had finished, after Nathan had finished, I said, Nathan, I have a couple questions for you. I said, Nathan, did you ever expect to get the Bible in your language? And he said, no, he had pretty much given up hope on that at 81. The second thing I said was, did you ever think God would use you to help get the Bible in your language? And he got a big smile on his face and said, no, I never thought that would happen. And the third thing I said is, what difference is this going to make, having God's word in your family, in your community? And he went on for several minutes talking about how blessed they were and what he was looking forward for God to do because they now had God's word in their heart language and it's just so exciting to be a part of that and you as partners with us are a part of that without you this wouldn't be possible both with financial support and with prayer as I said it's, it's amazing all the stuff that Satan is doing try to keep it from happening and we need your support prayerfully to Hold up the work that will continue to move forward. We have three goals at a workshop. One is spiritual growth. We don't just go and teach them how to translate, but we need to challenge them spiritually in their relationship with Jesus. Because translation is not an academic exercise. It is a spiritual exercise. This is God's word that they're translating. And most of them that were there, well, any of them there that were understood English and their language, I could go to their village and they could translate for me. So translation is not the issue. And the few organizations that are opposed to the mass process, it's not about the translation, it's whether or not they can understand the scripture so they can translate it accurately. But who is it that gives us understanding of the scripture? Education helps but where is it that we get that understanding? It's the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. He's the one that enlightens us. He's the one that illuminates Scripture for us. How often have you read a passage of Scripture several times, and you read it again, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says something, and it really speaks to your heart? Where does that come from? Scripture didn't change. It comes from the Holy Spirit working. And that is so important that we, we emphasize that this is a spiritual exercise. It's the Holy Spirit working through you to bring this about. We try to train and inspire, teach them the methodology, but then also to inspire them to use it. The thing that we talked about of this group that has this goal of going home and recruiting others and training them so that they can finish in as short a period of time as possible. And then the last is providing it in as attractive format as possible. It takes a lot of work uh, in a short period of time to go through and get it edited and looking nice so that it looks like the Bible, not just like some other document. And we feel that God honors that for them to take home as they present it to other people. And that's one of the things that we strive for. Uh, this is not a sunset. As you often see in missionary presentation, presentations, this is a sunrise. This was taken uh, out over the valley there. In fact, about where the sun is, is was in line with where the church was from where we were staying. 
but very much for the people in Uganda, this is the beginning. They're excited about looking forward to getting the Bible in their heart languages. And one of the pastors in particular has a heart for the Congo. And he's already contacted some people there about taking the process to the Congo and getting some of the language groups there, teaching them how to translate the Bible into their language. It's the beginning of something new that God is doing. And a, a couple verses that, that come to my mind. One, as we talk about all the spiritual warfare, we have the promise that Jesus said, greater is he that is in you than he is that's in the world. He said, in this world, you might have trouble. <laughs> Casey corrected me there. It's not that you might. He says, you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. You can expect it. And on this last trip, we had a variety of things before we ever left the country. We were supposed to have three flights. We ended up on our very first flight. It got delayed so much that they rerouted us. Um, all four of those flights were delayed. Uh, then the problem of getting there, luggage not getting there. In the midst of all of it, the other, one of the guys that went with me, I turned to him a couple times and said, I said, Mickey, God must have something really exciting in store because Satan is fighting so hard against it. And when Satan is fighting that hard, I have learned over the years that's usually an indication that God's got something really cool that he wants to have happen. And if Satan can get me discouraged, get me messed up, give me a bad attitude, then he can interfere with that happening. But as I continue to trust in him, God can do some fantastic things through it. So there's that. And then I'd, I'd like to take just a minute and look at uh, 1 John chapter 3. If you have your Bible, you might want to turn there. 1 John chapter 3. In verse 11... He says, this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. How many of you have ever heard a pastor preach on the fact that we should love one another? Okay? The message from the beginning, right? We all know about that, that we should love one another. Pretty straightforward. If you go down to 16, verse 16, he says, we know what real love is. How do we know what real love is? Because Jesus gave up his life for us. So he's saying that's the standard of real love, that Jesus gave his life for us because of his love for us. And he goes on to say, so we ought also to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. How many of us would be willing to give up our life for a brother or sister in Christ? He expounds on that a little bit more in verse 17. He says, if someone has enough money to live well, most of us in this room have enough money to live pretty good. We're doing quite well. And he goes on and says, and he sees a brother in need, but shows no compassion. He says, if we're doing well, and we see somebody in need, and we don't show compassion. Now, what kind of need? Is he just talking about financial need? Or how about spiritual need? These brothers and sisters that we've gone to share with have a desire to share with their families, the people in their communities, to be able to have God's word in their heart language so that they can understand the love of God and they can become disciples and grow in their relationship to him. So that's another kind of need that is out there. So if he sees a brother and sister but has no, no, shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? If someone has enough money to live well and sees his brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear friends, let us not merely say that we love each other, but let us show the truth by our actions. It's one thing to say we love our brother, but what are we doing about it? Am I willing to give up my life? Or how about my lifestyle? Am I willing to live a little bit more meager lifestyle so that others, brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that have a need, that that need can be met? Or am I so intent on my life 
that I need to maintain that. And finally, in verse 19, he says, Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we'll be confident when we stand before God. He's saying someday we're all going to have to stand before God and give an account. And what am I going to have to say? Yeah, God, I, I had a good life, and I really enjoyed it. And yeah, I knew that there were people in need, but I wasn't willing to take my time and go help them. Not just my finances, but what about my time? There are lots of people that still need God's word around the world. And how am I going to respond? And when I stand before God, what am I going to say to him on that final day? To say, okay, God, you spoke to my heart, and I chose to go forward. As you've heard me say sometimes in the past, when I first heard about the opportunity with Wycliffe Associates about being involved, and I sent an email to Melody at work, and she responded with six words that changed our life. She said, go ahead and check it out. Six little words that as we began to seek God's will made a tremendous difference in our lives and how God has blessed not only us, but through us and allowing God to work in and through us to bless other people. So as I would challenge you this morning, as God speaks to your heart about your love for other people, do you have that compassion to reach out and help others? Or is your primary concern maintaining your lifestyle? And that's between you and God, because someday you will stand before him and give an account. God, we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to share, to share here with brothers and sisters in Christ, people from our family, people that we know. But God, as we've shared with family around the world, to see you work and to see the excitement as people hear about you and have the opportunity to get the Bible in their language. But God, we know that there's still much to be done in the next seven years to reach Vision 2025, to get a Bible in every language. And so we just ask that as you would touch people's hearts here, that you would give them the courage to say, yes, God, I'm willing to trust you and have the compassion to step out and do what needs to be done to get your word to those that don't have it. Thanks again for all you're doing in our hearts and lives. And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Rosa. Sharon, I'm sure they'll stick around for a little while if you'd like to share with them or ask them some questions um, or even how you can be involved in, uh, in Bible translation and maybe God's calling you uh, to step up and be a part of that. That'd be great. Would you stand with us as we close this morning? Thank you.
Lord, thank you that you're faithful, even as we heard of the work going on around the world. Lord, you're faithful. Uh, they've never walked alone, as the Harmons walked in different places and different cultures. And Lord, it's true here as well. We always uh, have you, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.